language. So it's 1.01 p.m. in Bratislava, and I think we should be precise on time and start. Uh, good afternoon to all uh, our distinguished panelists and to all our participants. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alisa Mazur. I'm a research fellow at TopSec Policy Institute, uh, Bratislava-based think tank. And today we are delighted to partner with our colleagues and actually neighbors from the Czech Republic Association for International Affairs uh, to organize today's uh, timely uh, discussion on the topic of COVID-19 as a stress test for the Eastern Partnership Resilience. Uh, last year marked an important 10th anniversary of the Eastern Partnership Initiative. It's a joint initiative of the European Union, uh, its member states and its six neighboring countries namely Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, the Republic of Moldova and Ukraine. Uh, this March, uh, European Commission presented a joint communication on the Eastern Partnership Policy beyond 2020 under the title Reinforcing Resilience, an Eastern Partnership that delivers to all, for all. Uh, so um, while the resilience became this main uh, meta-narrative, let's call it, of the Commission proposal, uh, today was my uh, excellent panel of speakers will try to actually define what exactly stands behind this new buzzword of resilience and even more importantly what concrete policy proposals are there. Uh, we'll also try to assess the current situation uh, amid COVID-19 crisis uh, in, in the region, uh, what kind of challenges this country faces and uh, whether the EU response, the response of the new geopolitical commission to the pandemic crisis in, in the neighborhood is actually adequate to the current situation. And ahead of the Eastern Partnership Summit, which is supposed to happen next, uh, next month, it would be interesting also to hear some, some of your thoughts and maybe uh, insights and what are expectations of it. So I'm not taking any more time and I would like to turn to our um, great distinguished panel today and to present them to you. Um, Andres Kubelius, uh, former Prime Minister of Lithuania, member of European Parliament, uh, who is the chair of the delegation to the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, Yaroslav Kurfurst, a special envoy of the Eastern Partnership at the Czech Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Pavel Havlicek, a research fellow of, of Association of International Affairs. Uh, Pata Gaprin, Gaprindashvili, <laughs> director of Georgia's Reform Associates. Uh, Andrei Elisei, uh, head of monitoring group of ISANS and also a research director of the East Center. And Maria Zolkina, an analyst at the Ilko Kucherev Democratic Initiatives Foundation. So uh, before that, I'll just a uh, few housekeeping rules for our participants. Uh, you will have a, also opportunity to put questions to our participants, which I will uh, try to raise during our uh, second part of our debate. So please, uh, uh, if you follow us on the Zoom platform, put them directly into the Q&A session. If you follow live streams on the platform, put them in the comments. We'll try to monitor and, uh, and I hope our, I will receive uh, all of them. So uh, at first I would like to turn to Pavel. Uh, you've been closely watching the region in the recent years. Um, your profile is exactly an Eastern partnership. You have a lot of interest in developments in Ukraine. Uh, I would like to ask you to provide us maybe with a starting point for this discussion. Uh, what is the like, short overview of the situation in the region? And also maybe you can bring us some clarity uh, to the debate and define this uh, resilience uh, definition and, and what actually we understand under this term in, in the current context. The floor is yours, Pavel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elisa, for your kind introduction. Uh, indeed, I will try to give you uh, the overview of the, the challenges and uh, the biggest obstacles that we are now uh, seeing for uh, the resilience in Eastern Partnership um, region. I will try to share my screen with you. And uh, since I pre pre prepared a small presentation for you. So I hope you can now see it. Um, and so, um, yes, I will just try to also display it. Can't see it myself now. Okay. Let's let's go here then. Um, right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so so um, first, before we start and jump in into the presentation. 
I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, tell you why I actually shared uh, this first picture with you, which is not uh, coming from the Eastern Partnership, but this, this is from Prague. And uh, this is just to underscore how, how similar are our problems, uh, both in the EU and Eastern Partner countries. So this is obviously the case for, for the COVID-19 pandemic, but this is also the case for uh, Russians' influence operations and, uh, and um, hybrid, uh, um, hybrid operations. Uh, this one, for example, is related to issues of historical memory and, and removal of the uh, statue of the Soviet general um, Marshal Konev. Uh, so let me jump into the presentation itself. First of all, I wanted to define what we are actually speaking about, the concept of resilience, which, as you can see, uh, the EU is approaching from a rather wide uh, perspective. So we have several issues, democracy, society, media, or actually uh, public health. That is a new domain uh, in the Eastern Partnership, uh, as presented by the, the uh, Commission's uh, communication, as mentioned by Alisa. So I will try to uh, tell you more about several of these. So first, uh, as for the democratic uh, component, we can see that uh, we can see uh, this is this is the data from the most recent uh, Freedom House report, which you can have a look at. And also, I wanted to uh, point your attention to the upcoming uh, electoral processes because there are actually four of them coming up for the region itself. We will have. Uh, two uh, important presidential elections in Belarus and Moldova in the second half of the year, and also a crucial parliamentary vote in Georgia um, that Pata hopefully will tell us more about. And finally, not to forget also regional elections in, uh, in Ukraine, which will be also very important for uh, Zelensky administration. Uh, second, uh, to speak about society and, and demography, in fact, uh, here you have uh, some information about how, uh, how the region has done in terms of actually uh, outpopulation and outmigration. This is a big challenge for the whole region. You can see uh, especially difficult figures for Georgia, but also Armenia, uh, Ukraine, very complicated people leaving abroad due to socioeconomic situation, but also other, other affairs. Another big issue to have in mind. Uh, thirdly, uh, as for economy, we can see that the current pandemic, obviously, and uh, the lockdown in uh, not only in the societies, but also economies, in fact, is, uh, is actually not uh, anything pleasant for the region. You can see uh, big problems as elaborated by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, the biggest uh, decline uh, marked by Georgia year to year uh, comparison. Uh, minus 10%, which is indeed a big economic shock for the countries as well. Uh, so just to just to balance and uh, deliver on a more positive note, as, as I see it, uh, the EU support um, uh, both to the in, inter, um, immediate uh, kind of responses to the medical state of uh, affairs, uh, uh, as you can see on the right side of the screen, but also actually microfinancial assistance uh, to uh, some of the, the countries. Uh, you can see Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, the three associated countries. So when we speak about the differentiation and more close cooperation with associated countries, this is one of the concrete examples of this. Jumping further on, uh, also related to security, actually. Geopolitics didn't disappear from, uh, from our uh, vocabulary and from uh, the security threats that the region has faced. You can see, uh, we can see uh, increased passportization in the so-called uh, People's Republics in the east of Ukraine. We can see um, uh, borderization, continued borderization in, in Georgia that Pata will, again, I hope, uh, elaborate more, uh, or also um, the recent Russian initiatives uh, aimed at Nagorno-Karabakh and the Lavrov's, so-called Lavrov's plant for introducing a peacekeeping mission to, to the area. Again, we should closely watch. Uh, so now what actually is bothering us very much, obviously I've already hinted on the uh, issue of public, uh, public health that is uh, a new domain for the Eastern Partnership and should be for the coming upcoming years. We can see uh, the situation in the region. You can see how, uh, how the number of uh, cases is actually uh, sharply increasing. Um, 
just just for your attention, uh, the the uh, two of the lines on the right side are not described. The orange one is on um, is Armenian one, and uh, the green one uh, Azerbaijani. You can see obviously the biggest problem in Belarus that uh, Andrei uh, hopefully will tell us more about later. Um, again, some more some more uh, data, some breaking down uh, the figures. Uh, we can see again uh, Belarus, unfortunately, uh, being the, the the most affected, even if uh, uh, as for the third table, deaths per million people, we can see that Moldova is actually uh, is unfortunately uh, facing the biggest obstacles, and this is done both due to uh, problems with the medical um, kind of uh, healthcare system, but also uh, due to chaotic and fragmented direction of the local government. Um, jumping further on the healthcare systems, I already hinted. Um, you can see the comparison with the EU itself and uh, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Ukraine not really uh, coping uh, well in terms of uh, actually tackling the, the, the challenge. Uh, these are all data from the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum and their recent project, just to mention. So finally, let me conclude with this uh, final slide and um, just um, kind of a rhetoric rhetorical question from my side, which uh, will be very interesting to, to hear more from our uh, two colleagues uh, uh, from Yaroslav and, and also Andrius, Andrius uh, who uh, are representing the decision-making bodies indeed. Um, but from my side, actually, we can basically approach this, uh, this issue from three possible perspectives. Continuation of more or less the same approach as we have seen um, when, when, when observing what the Commission and Council actually uh, presented, so not so much of a change in fact. Uh, we can also uh, basically uh, see um, Eastern Partnership lost uh, somewhere in among the e, uh, EU policies and, and, and fragmentation within the EU itself and internal debates on solidarity and economic response. Or, and this is my, uh, my preferred option and something that I would like to spend the last seconds on, and this is basically uh, if there are some opportunities. And I would say that these, these are present, and I've already hinted on that when speaking about the economic um, uh, cooperation and uh, financial aid to the EAP countries from the side of the, of the Union. And obviously this brings me back to what Alisa mentioned uh, when speaking about the geopolitical and in fact also job geoeconomic Geo European Commission, which might bring bring the difference to the region. And with sufficient, uh, sufficient help uh, for economic restart and, and uh, smart conditionality, as I uh, dare to, dare to uh, believe, we can actually uh, win the hearts and minds of the local population and also of the local elites and possibly get uh, the EAP countries finally on our side. But for that, we will need not only the political will and uh, strong, strong support from all uh, the EU members, and, but also a certain level of generosity from, from the side. And this is also true for the upcoming uh, multi-annual financial framework. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paolo, for such a great uh, baseline for our debate. Uh, you already raised a lot of questions. I will also try to, to follow up on all of them with our speakers. Um, Mr. Kubilus, as your name was already mentioned, uh, I would like to turn now to you and to hear uh, your uh, your view on uh, all the mentioned questions already, the view from the so-called Brussels bubble. Um, so, how can how can you deliver on this uh, promise of reinforcing resilience in, in the Eastern Partnership? Uh, what do you see can be the concrete steps in the next days as this new package of uh, deliverables is going to be developed? And um, taking into account that we already mentioned we are having the new geopolitical commission, yeah? uh, and uh, it's been already uh, mentioned before that now EU is ready to project power globally. But my question will be, is EU ready to project power in its immediate neighborhood, in the Eastern Partnership? And what we're going to see in this uh, renewed package of deliverables. Uh, I know that you yourself came up with this great initiative of TRIO strategy, for example. There will be a, a, a important vote next week in the AFIT committee. Maybe you could also tell us a bit more about that. Well, Alisa, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot to everybody. You know, really a pleasure. And I will try to be very brief. And since uh, but, uh, you know, he shaked his negative, <laughs> uh, you know, he showed negative signs. So I agree with some, some of those negative signs. And when, when we're talking about, you know, EU, EU ambition to, to, to 
to project its power into the region. That's, that's still the question. Of course, when we are talking about resilience and, and COVID-19 uh, pandemics, we, we need to see really in a very clear eyes all the challenges challenges inside of EU, I will not elaborate on, uh, on them, you know, challenges, you know, in Eastern Partnership region. Of course, there are challenges even in Russia, and that can be quite a factor, which maybe next, next you know, seminar we will make on, on that issue. On, on Eastern Partnership, really, you know, we, we shall see perhaps all the traditional uh, challenges to resilience. First of all, a challenge to democracy itself, health of democracy. You know, this, uh, what is called, you know, rally to the flag phenomenon, very well known in everywhere, you know. We're watching that in, even in Lithuania, being in opposition, I am a little bit, you know, nervous about seeing uh, popularity ratings of the government, you know, which is uh, fighting pandemics. The same is happening in EU, the same is, is starting to happen in Eastern partnership countries. And what we were talking, you know, before, that I am now quite an often guest on, on Georgian TV, uh, because of recent developments in Georgia. And again, I see the same, you know, that the government decided that, you know, they can uh, come to a little bit, to forget their promises, to use some kind of a little bit of authoritarian power before, before elections, that, that is a challenge. Second, of course, we need to see that uh, possible challenges even can increase, especially when we're talking about uh, how economy will do. Economical crisis, still we are perhaps at the first stages of economical crisis, and that can be really quite a difficult period of time. And again, it will bring, you know, it will bring a lot of challenges to Eastern partnership countries who, who have not a very strong, strong economy. And the last point, of course, uh, what Russia will do with all the hybrid, uh, you know, force, what see, we see, you know, even during pandemics, they are not forgetting, you know, Prague or some other countries. So those are, uh, that is a picture. What can be what can be an answer from EU side? How to help Eastern partnership countries? I would, I have a very simple answer. You know, it's of course ambitious. You know, long term Eastern partnership strategy. That would be my my clear answer. Of course, the question is what what we shall have, you know, quite soon. We had uh, Commission communication. We had Foreign Affairs uh, Council, you know, recently decision. We are discussing after, you know, report. I am not so, so, you know, not so positive about all those, you know, uh, papers. Well, it does not, you know, it does not how to say. It's not an end to, to the life. We shall live after, even after, uh, you know, Eastern Partnership Summit, uh, but, uh, when we are trying to talk, you know, that really Eastern partnership countries need to have a clear vision, uh, you know, we need to go with that, you know, what we can call, you know, carrot and stick approach, you know, with some kind of new flagship initiatives, more for more, you know, very, very well known, you know, language. Unfortunately, what I see, it's not more for more, but more, more of the same uh, in, in all that language. You know. So, that makes me, me, you know, not so happy. But again, I am, I am not, not, you know, not, uh, not going to, uh, to, 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 to conclude that this is some kind of tragedy and things and things, you know, very, 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 very tragic. So what I see as, as, as really what I would expect, you know, from uh, geopolitical commission, which everybody likes that title. I would expect a very simple thing, just for the, for the beginning, to ask commission, leaders of the commission, uh, first of all, commission president Ursula von der Leyen, uh, Joseph Borrell, who are making very good statements, geopolitical statements on Western Balkans. When they speak in a very clear geopolitical language, if EU is not coming into Western Balkan region, Western Balkan region will be destabilized you know, by Russia, maybe by Turkey or even China. That is, I am quoting, you know, in some way what they're saying. I am dreaming and I am, I am, I am hoping that still I will, I will, I will uh, face such a moment when either Ursula von der Leyen or, or Joseph Borrell will repeat the same statements when they will speak about Eastern Partnership region. Unfortunately, for the time being, that is not the case. 
uh, when they are speaking you know, about Eastern partnership region, the language is not so ambitious, not so geopolitically clear. Despite the fact that this region is exactly destabilized by Russia and uh, needs exactly you know, much more clear EU strategy uh, towards that region. We can guess what is, what is the difference in between of Western Balkans and Eastern partnership region. You no, know, it's uh, not a secret. You know, I'm always saying that uh, the biggest difference is, is distance from Tirana or Skopje to Moscow is larger than distance from Kiev or Tbilisi to Moscow. And that's, that's what, we, what, we, <laughs> what we see. Uh, and, uh, but in any case, you know, really I see, I see, especially when we are talking about both you know, nearest future and longer term future, we need to work uh, permanently to try to have more ambitious you know, agenda, at least for those who are you know, in front of, of, uh, of, of you know, the reforms like three of countries. And that is what we shall try to do. That, that's the only way how we can uh, strengthen resilience of this you know, region. And then how we can really practically create uh, success of, of this region, economical, social, and, and, and geopolitical success. And that is the only way how we can, from EU side, how we can at least attempt to try to, in a positive way, to assist uh, positive transformation even in Russia. Maybe not during Putin time, but uh, this is the only way. Example, example of success of Ukraine can have the major geopolitical impact uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in that transformation. I am not forgetting about Georgia, but of course, Ukraine with its you know, size can make a big difference. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Anders. And now from, from Brussels to Prague, uh, where, by the way, to remind you all the Eastern Partnership uh, was officially launched already 11 years ago during the Czech Republic's presidency in the European Council. Um, Aroslav, I would like to ask you, uh, assessing the, the progress which has been done, or maybe lack of progress, of planned progress in the recent 11 years, uh, what can we do better? As uh, Pavel asked what to expect beyond 2020, so what lessons should we learn and uh, take into account this whole resilience concept? which, as far as I know, you've been a strong proponent of, uh, how can we actually measure this progress in reinforcing resilience? What are the concrete deliverables you know, should be there in this next Eastern Partnership package? And also take into account the whole security situation in the region, knowing that the security won't be in that package. How can we, how can we really uh, manage to achieve the progress in that? Thank you. Sorry, we don't hear you. Uh, just have your microphone. So maybe now it's better. So thank you very much, and thank, uh, thanks, thanks for again to our presentation and greetings to all the participants. I will start with the more concrete and then go to more general. <clears throat> As you mentioned, uh, Czechia was a great proponent of the concept of resilience. So I would uh, start with uh, that concept what, uh, because the original non-paper and the idea was uh, uh, written in Prague and then uh, um, we got the support from other countries and then commission adopted as a, as you said, meta-narrative. But um, um, I met some misunderstanding in some uh, partner countries because they see the resilience as a passive way of the European Union, how to approach the Eastern partners. You make them own uh, resilient, and then you don't care because they are already resilient. But uh, uh, this is a first very strong case I would like to make that the resilience is not abstract and uh, resilience is not passive. This is a very, very active policy. Uh, I would like to explain how and why. Um, we believe that uh, vulnera uh, the resilience is the way how to cover vulnerabilities. So you look at the vulnerability and you try to actively approach and uh, um, make this uh, partner or this entity immune and capable to cope with. Now, um, of course, we structure this abstract way to many different uh, uh, segments, which are very concrete. 
And we proposed, and that was the main idea in the non-paper. And now if you look at the council conclusions in the article eight, you will see that this is the main message. We need to approach uh, resilience by concrete practical project to transform this abstract notion to a very concrete activities. And uh, well, let's take the example of uh, pandemics. Here, I think it's a very clear evidence that the concept of resilience was a very well selected for the, uh, let's say, future uh, years, because we uh, discovered that in many countries, not only the Eastern Partnership, but also the EU, they are vulnerabilities. And in a current situation, you see healthcare systems collapsing in many, um, uh, many countries. Now, we, we have to discover the vulnerabilities before the crisis occurs. But for example, now I can see that uh, the EU will undertake the stress test uh, of the healthcare system in the EU countries. I would argue for us as the European Union to invite uh, Eastern partners to be part of this process uh, to use the same methodology and really be integrated in that effort and uh, make a profit and benefit of uh, all this. And here you have already one very concrete project of uh, resilience. And then you can have a look on the media literacy uh, facing the hybrid threats. We all learn in the EU, but also in the Eastern Partnership. Then we can uh, move on uh, across the spectrum, uh, which, which, uh, which is mentioned in this Article 8 of the Council Conclusions, until the human resilience of conflict-affected people or until the uh, environmental resilience. So, this is a first point I wanted to make. Resilience is not a passive policy. This is the very active approach where the concrete money good should go to a very concrete uh, uh, project. Now, I would like to um, say how Czechia want, wants to use this uh, uh, concept. We want to direct our transformational money. We want to use and invite the, the Visegrad friends. For example, in, in terms of pandemics, we created in the uh, Visegrad International Fund this uh, Eastern uh, the, the V4 Eastern Partnership uh, Solidarity Fund, uh, the new program. And this is just a concrete example. We want to really work in this direction. Now, the bigger vision. Uh, we believe that uh, in the EU, there is uh, a division um, uh, between the more ambitious countries where Czechia belongs and the countries which are much less ambitious. Uh, the same um, divide is within the partners front or group. And the result and the outcome of the policy should be or will be uh, somewhere in, the, in between. Um, so always it will be much less ambitious than Czechia would like to see or Lithuania would like to see or other, other like-minded countries, unfortunately. For us uh, as uh, Czechs, so we approach the future vision uh, of the Eastern Partnership with three big uh, strategic directions. First, implementation. Uh, let's not see it as uh, the bureaucratic process. This is a big issue. The second was resilience and the third was sectoral integration. And here I would argue we need even without maybe the perspective of uh, uh, enlargement, uh, because that's uh, not the very uh, consensual word in those days, the European Union, we need to find a way how to make uh, the sectoral integration possible for Eastern partners and offer them the sectoral integration from the internal market through different sectors until, for example, the education space or, or scientific space. So that's, uh, that's very important. So this is my general remark from concrete to general. And maybe if I have uh, two minutes uh, uh, or one minute to say something on the summit, yeah. Uh, of course, I will not reveal uh, where we are standing now because today there is a very hectic and very active uh, day. And I think that maybe we will see at the end of this uh, today, we will see the, the decision, how uh, it will play be played. But I will tell you uh, what is the check position. Of course, uh, I think we at that, at, at, at that moment, the most logical step would be just to postpone uh, a summit a little, little bit until the German presidency and have a full-fledged uh, in-person summit with a full-fledged declaration based on the council conclusions uh, um, and have it during the German presidency in person. 
send a strong political signal to our partners and to the world that we are, uh, we are so interested. Of course, we see that there is plenty of obstacles uh, 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 on different sides uh, and different motivations are behind it. Uh, in that case, we believe that the feasible option is the video conference, which will uh, come with, uh, uh, which will be held in 27 plus uh, Eastern partners on the highest level. So not only institutions, but 27. And there would be an outcome document. Uh, it would be nice to have a declaration, but let's not risk the failure uh, as last year. And uh, let's have a document which is good. Uh, um, if it is declaration, fine, but maybe it's not necessary. Un uh, but this necessity uh, is there to have a, a full declaration. So if we are not adopting the declaration, let's have a sort of compensatory summit uh, very early next year. Uh, and it will be clear that this new summit early next year will be a sort of um, compensation really for this year's summit, which is already the compensation for the summit uh, 2019, where the parliamentary elections took place. So um, thus we will not break up the periodicity and we will have a full-fledged summit in person with the declaration and we will gain one video conference of all the leadership behind the table. Um, but it would be good if the video conference adopt this, adopts uh, some paper. Uh, and that paper should really stress the importance of the Eastern Partnership first. Can maybe invite Eastern Partners to be part of the exercise of the post-COVID uh, measures and then announce uh, that they will be very early um, um, next year, this uh, substitute or compensatory, whatever we, we call it, summit. But really not, let's not move this summit further on to the second half of the year, because we need also to approve the programming document, which is post-20 deliverables for 2020. And by the beginning of the year, this is the highest moment when we can do it. So let's not forget about that uh, for the future perspective. So this is a check position. And I think that uh, that could be a good ground when I see for some consensus. Still, we are not giving up uh, the vision for this fall full-fledged summit, and we'll try to, uh, to promote it. Now, the last word or sentence about the Geopolitical Commission. It would be nice to have a Geopolitical Commission behaving strongly in the Eastern Partnership. But uh, when I listen to uh, the debate among the 27 partners, I really think we should drop that word and especially in context of Eastern Europe. Uh, in Russia, geopolitics mean really the ideology, very dangerous ideology. They don't understand what does it mean, really. Uh, the understanding of geopolitics is so diverse, even, even uh, among us. So let's have a strong policy, very ambitious policy, practically driven policy, policy of principles. And I think this word of geopolitics, uh, we don't need it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your strong introduction and explaining us also the, the, uh, the check stands on the upcoming uh, summit. And uh, let's hope we're going to have uh, more news at the end of the day. So now I would like to move to uh, our partners in the actually Eastern, uh, Eastern Partnership region. And first, I would like to turn to Andre and uh, ask you about Belarus and what's going on in the in the country these days. Um, Belarus has been made headlines since last year, first with the, this whole intensified pressure from Russia to uh, create the, the Union state. Uh, recently, uh, it had turned a lot of attention of football fans as uh, the only Belarusian uh, Premier League, uh, which didn't uh, stop uh, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So, its approach to counteracting COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been quite peculiar, I would say. Um, so maybe could you elaborate us more what's the real situation on the ground, uh, how institutions are coping with uh, this crisis, taking into account that there have been no drastic measures to prevent the further spreading as it's been basically all around Europe. And what are the actual moods in society, what people think about this? actions or other lack of actions, especially as you also have upcoming presidential elections this year, how it will affect or affect the whole political developments in the country. You know. 
Right. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, at first glance, uh, Belarus seems being better equipped uh, to handle the epidemic than democratic countries, thanks to uh, centralization of power and machinery of coercion and uh, mass surveillance tools. But in reality, it's largely distanced uh, itself from duly mitigating the impact of the epidemic. The authorities of Belarus uh, did not resort to outright denialism uh, as uh, Tajikistan or Turkmenistan did, but it certainly downplayed the severity of the coronavirus uh, threat to uh, public health. Uh, so the Belarusian authorities uh, are approaching the epidemic in uh, um, in a quite oblique fashion without the kind of seriousness uh, which the neighboring uh, countries uh, have adopted. The state officials and the media uh, largely follow uh, Alexander Lukashenko's narratives um, and uh, consistently minimize the threat. As you may know, Lukashenko has promoted uh, work in the field, steaming in sound and taking vodka shots for as a cure. Uh, coronavirus measures uh, have remained um, advisory elsewhere and not mandatory. Uh, throughout the countries, uh, uh, the country's schools, gyms and uh, restaurants are open and uh, people go to work and public transportation continues to operate without interruption. Uh, let me uh, show you a short uh, video compiled by myself and uh, Isan's colleagues, uh, which uh, brings uh, together excerpts of uh, state uh, TV reports about um, uh, coronavirus. Just a moment, uh, I hope you can see it. Приятно смотреть по телевизору. Люди на тракторе работают, никто не говорит про вирусы. Там трактор вылечит всех, полю всех лечит. Вчера мне врачи сказали, что при ультрафиолете, вот в солнечном свете, вирус погибает. Так чего же мы прячем людей в эти крематории, в эти... Что касается парада, как бы это ни настораживало присутствующих здесь врачей, должен сказать, что мы не можем отменить парад. Просто не можем. В год юбилея Победы, возможно, не лишнее вспомнить, как 75 лет назад, объединившись, народом удалось победить коричневую чуму 20 века. А у Шаната была куда страшнее коронавирусной инфекции COVID-19. И, конечно, мы не могли удержаться, чтобы не побывать на неделе на футболе. Все-таки о нем сейчас говорит весь мир. Белорусский чемпионат – единственный из всех европейских, которые не отменили из-за пандемии. Физкульт привета от белорусских футболистов. Наш протест против пандемии, ну или просто способ порадовать болельщиков. Их сегодня, кстати говоря, даже больше, чем обычно. Матч ведь принципиальный. В европейские страны сомневаются, продлевать карантин или нет. И не то, чтобы болеть перестали или поддались на усталость населения от карантина. Просто экономика на дне. So, uh, as, as, you, as you saw, the uh, state media ridiculed the virus. They say that uh, the epidemic, uh, that the pan panic around it is even worse uh, than the virus and so on. Luckily, uh, so far, Belarus uh, has um, healthcare infrastructure to handle the coronavirus, but the numbers are uh, growing and institutional capacity has its limits. So, as Pavel already, already showed, Belarus reports over 25,000 uh, uh, cases uh, uh, it, um, it's, um, it leads uh, among all post-Soviet countries uh, uh, in, uh, in numbers of uh, coronavirus infected people per capita. It also, I believe now in top uh, 15 European countries in terms of uh, absolute uh, number of coronavirus uh, cases. Um, at, at the same time, uh, Belarus reports unrealistically low uh, fatality case ratios. Um, independent media and bloggers, uh, opposition and civil society, on the other hand, inform about the um, risks uh, posed by the coronavirus. Uh, civic initiatives uh, have been doing a great job of uh, fundraising and uh, supplying hospitals with the much needed protection equipment. Uh, so uh, parts of the society um, follows uh, physical distances, uh, distancing advice uh, despite the state policies. Uh, I can show you a couple of uh, peace centers uh, graphs 
Uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, based on Google Mobility reports. You can see uh, how um, how attendance of restaurants, how the use of public transportation, attendance of workplaces decreased in uh, Belarus uh, compared to Georgia and Moldova. Uh, as, as you can see, the numbers uh, um, went down to not uh, as big extent as in other Eastern Partnership countries. In Belarus, uh, the decrease uh, in, in throughout April was like around 20% compared to generally January. While in Georgia and Moldova, uh, the um, the decrease was uh, over 50%. Um, you can, uh, for instance. Um, also compare the numbers with the um, mobility trend reports in the Baltic uh, countries. Uh, so it is not, it's not surprised that today the Baltic countries uh, uh, abolish uh, the uh, sh border uh, shutdown between themselves. Uh, and uh, it's not surprised that the Baltic countries um, mitigated uh, the epidemic uh, uh, much more successfully. As you can see, the, um, uh, the reduction of uh, physical contacts uh, was uh, much larger. Uh, so in case the epidemic worsens uh, in, in the coming weeks and, uh, and in case the Kremlin does um, better uh, with standing it, then it will likely use it for its own interests. And uh, the pro Kremlin media already started testing the ground. Uh, they um, reported that Belarus may not handle the epidemic without Russia's support. And all this uh, is um, developing um, in, on the eve of the presidential election, uh, which uh, is appointed uh, to take place on uh, August uh, 9th. So to sum up, uh, the coronavirus epidemic uh, laid bare the vulnerabilities that the uh, personalistic uh, political regime and views of one person um, cause and demonstrated uh, how this peculiarity increase, increases the fragility of the Belarusian state and, and society in the face of the coronavirus threat. Thank you, Andres, so much for your uh, interactive uh, intervention. It was really interesting also to see the, the reports from the media. I think it uh, can be my another question to you on the whole, uh, not pandemics, but infodemics. Uh, but now I would like to turn to our Georgian colleague, uh, Pata. Um, Georgia has been a, a clear champion uh, in, in the Eastern Partnership Room for years, uh, always a great example of democracy promotion, reforms implementation. Unfortunately, uh, uh, tendency in the recent months has been more negative. Um, it's also an important year of election, as also Pavel mentioned before, in October, parliamentary elections. So how are you managed to cope with all this ongoing situation, with the whole political developments, with the pandemic crisis on one hand? Also, we see more and more reports of this illegal borderization on the other hand. So if you could please sum up to us the, the, the whole picture of what's going on now on the ground. Thanks a lot. I'm very glad to be one of the participants among such distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Uh, of course, I will talk a bit about Georgia, an ongoing uh, situation uh, in, in here, as well as uh, about the prospects of the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, seen from <clears throat> Georgia. And of course, one cannot surprise, you know, uh, citizens of, of this country uh, with challenging times we all find in, uh, because those challenging times are never uh, over in Georgia. Uh, well, in uh, 2008, uh, uh, Georgia, of course, experienced the aggression from Russia, as a result of which uh, uh, we sort of our territories um, have started uh, being occupied. How, but, but on the other side, the economy also was gravely hit. And uh, in 2009, for the first time, Georgia had a contraction of economy by 4%. And by the way, we expect now as a result of pandemic, uh, the forecast, uh, there are different forecasts of different organizations, but uh, it's gonna be about, um, uh, I mean, the contraction gonna be about 5%. And if the proper and effective um, measures are put in place, uh, then we would expect uh, Georgia to reach the same level of economic growth uh, by the year of uh, 2022. So that shows you how the grave, uh, how great the situation is indeed is. 
Um, uh, now, um, uh, well, I, I, I myself not, don't like, you know, to divide, you know, times before, during, and after pandemics. And I will explain you what I, what I mean. Whatever weaknesses and strengths, you know, uh, any country, but my particular country and its society uh, has uh, had up until now, those weaknesses and uh, strengths are being now uh, sort of accentuated and uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are sort of being even exposed uh, uh, by the pandemic. So we need, of course, to talk about what was before, uh, how the situation uh, was unfolding and that what preceded, you know, the uh, uh, current crisis. And uh, in that context, I want to talk about the state of democracy in the context of forthcoming elections, as I was uh, suggested to have the brief uh, uh, overview. Alisa, you said that uh, uh, the last month's situation has started, you know, to, to worsen. I'm afraid it's not uh, only uh, in the last months, but uh, in past years, I would say, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, we sort of uh, democratic institution building has has, has got worse, and although we still remain or have remained as uh, as uh, as one of the front runner, as as it is uh, uh, labeled uh, um, uh, by many in the European um, uh, in the Eastern Partnership, uh, but but let us not forget that once you know a few years ago it was Moldova who was a front runner, and due to the uh, deteriorating situ uh, circumstances in the democratic institution building, of course. Uh, 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 then uh, uh, the Moldova sort of lost that, that title. So what matters here is a sustainability. We sustainably to keep moving forward in terms of institution, uh, democratic institution building. So what's the situation is about? The ruling party and its leader have uh, already gambled once a few months ago on, uh, um, uh, on reversing uh, uh, the promise uh, to hold, you know, uh, the elections based on the proportional system of elections that enjoys the overwhelming uh, support uh, uh, from whole political spectrum and the wider public. As a result, uh, I will not dwell much on that. As a result, they have failed. Uh, but at the same time, of course, country's reputation uh, has been uh, has suffered further. Uh, then uh, it was the um, in, in March, in the beginning of March, it was the EU as well as the US so who have sort of uh, uh, mediated talks uh, between the ruling party and the opposition, uh, uh, as a result of which uh, the agreement uh, uh, was struck uh, uh, on 8th of uh, uh, March. But despite the agreement, uh, and that's very important. Uh, and of course, that, that, was the, that is the agreement uh, uh, which uh, called, you know, or urged the political, I mean, the uh, authorities to uh, re release as we label them, and friends to Georgia label them political prisoners from, uh, uh, from, from uh, uh, their imprisonment. Uh, so what happens next, uh, uh, and that's perhaps uh, uh, would best, be, best reflect your reference to what's been happening in the last months. Uh, despite the agreement and hoping that crisis times will play on, on, on their side, the ruling party again and its leader uh, have apparently decided to gamble uh, uh, again and this time not to uphold the principles of independent uh, 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 judiciary. But it's what, what is even more worrisome is that to, in that sense, they to test the reaction of our best allies in, in Europe and beyond. Um, well, uh, I have to say, uh, and thanks to God, the reaction followed. It did not work, the gambling yet again, that, that gambling has not worked and the reaction uh, followed. And again, Americans and Europeans uh, are both called on Georgian authorities to fulfill commitments and promises they made under 8th March uh, echo. Okay, now, uh, unfortunately, uh, and that's what I said already, recent years, Georgia has already made compro compromises on democratic institution building, human rights protection of human rights, freedom of the media, uh, and rule of law, etc. Uh, and, and here comes very important point that relates to the Eastern Partnership and perhaps and the, including the recent uh, um, uh, joint communication. Um, and one of the uh, uh, negative consequences as a result of this deteriorating or backsliding uh, in the democratic uh, uh, development path has already been uh, uh, reflected in the recent communication. Uh, 
um, um, joint communication of the European Commission. That's all. That's not only about Georgia, of course, uh, but we also should uh, uh, get you know our uh, uh, our lessons learned from that. And uh, the recent communication talks that the EU. That's what we supported. That's uh, I think what Pavel has already labeled as a smart conditionality. That's what we unfortunately what we would welcome, and what we welcome. However, that, that says that you will consider progress in rule of law reforms when deciding on assistance. And now what's been happening during pandemic, uh, the EU, uh, uh, and we, we, we are tremendously grateful, of course, uh, uh, to the EU that has mobilized about 1.5 billion Georgian uh, uh, currency, which is about 500 million uh, euros to help Georgia getting through the current health crisis and uh, um, 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 to help uh, to tackle the economic and social challenges. But, you know, uh, the problem is that getting a part of this amount can already be put under the question mark. And according to the statement of uh, chair of the EU's parliamentary delegation, uh, uh, Andrius uh, Kubilius, and I'm quoting, the part of Georgia's budget support dis disbursements will be tied to specific conditions for Georgia, in particular uh, to implementation of on ongoing reforms uh, in the areas of rule of law, judicial, electoral uh, reform. That shows you, uh, you know, one of the negative consequences uh, uh, of the uh, years long uh, um, com uh, compromising on, on the rule of law, etc. Let me bring you another example, and unfortunately, the list is uh, a bit longer. Suspension, to say the least, uh, of the fundamentally important uh, Anatlia deep water port project implementation is another example of damaging consequences of that non-democratic or unaccountable uh, uh, way of the governance. Very few words about the Eastern Partnership. Uh, <clears throat> really sorry, but if you just uh, finalize yourself because we're really running out of time already. Yeah, indeed. Uh, when yeah. it comes to the Eastern Partnership and recent communication and the, um, the council conclusions, uh, which has been recently approved, we truly find it uh, to borrow the, again the word from one of the articles of uh, Andrew Skubilius, a bit disappointing. Uh, and it's not because it does not contain practical steps. And those practical practicalities, if you will, uh, is being uh, recognized and welcomed. However, it is not about, as conclusion puts it, overriding policy framework. It cannot serve, uh, that's to my uh, judgment, as a, uh, a long-term policy framework why? Because it falls short. It, it falls short on political signaling, on ambitions, uh, irrespective of what we call the Commission geopolitical strong or what. It it talks about you know sort of a timidity, uh, a timid approach uh, to to its Eastern partnership. And last but not the not the least, Andrew's already uh, mentioned about the Western Balkans. It was, to my best memory, only Angela Merkel a few months ago who put the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova in particular in the context of the uh, European Union's policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Western Balkans. But that was, unfortunately, only a rhetorical statement. She referred to the possibility of those trio countries. She did not use that word, uh, term trio. However, she referred to the possibility they to be, hypothetically speaking, next part, provided that they implement association agreements, et cetera, after, you know, Western Balkan countries, you know, uh, accomplish uh, uh, their mission. But unfortunately, since that very rhetorical sort of, a, and very much welcome statement, you know, the attitudes have been, uh, have largely disappeared from including the Germany side. But let me stop here and I would, uh, rather be open, you know, to continue uh, my, my sort of further brief overview about the Russia's ongoing, you know, uh, uh, occupation and current malign operations, even during pandemic times in mm -hmm. Georgia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a good analysis. And last but not least, uh, Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, with us Maria, uh, and uh, there have been a lot of events also happening in Ukraine. Uh, next week is going to be uh, the first anniversary of. Mr. Zelensky uh, on his uh, presidential position. There have been many political movements also in the recent days and weeks, uh, changes of some key figures in some key institutions, rumors of some more upcoming changes, for example, in such key institutions as Naftagas. So um, how do you assess 
all this moves in between, uh, yeah, what's going on with the COVID-19, what's going on with situation, security situation in Donbass, and what are the people moves? You are the sociologist. I would like to ask you also maybe to provide us some recent numbers on the, the recent support of Zelensky personally, of his political force, and also the governmental efforts in counteracting this current mm -hmm. healthcare crisis. Uh, thank you, Alisa. Um, yes, I have been working with the public opinion uh, in different variations with different research regarding how uh, people assess that that uh, developments uh, taken, uh, which take place in the society. Uh, and uh, the COVID-19 and all the developments internal and uh, attempts of authorities to react to all these challenges connected to COVID-19 is a good example to measure how um, in practice uh, people evaluate uh, concrete public institutions in, in the unprecedented time of crisis when everything depends on um, the speed of reaction and the effectiveness of uh, authorities' reaction, etc. And here regarding Ukraine, there might be a couple of important conclusions. First, <clears throat> um, uh, is related to the question of trust. Uh, it appears that the president uh, is the only one <clears throat> public institution uh, which have the, the trust uh, from people, from average people, from average uh, population in the time of crisis. And as of now, none of uh, other high uh, political and public institutions have uh, more people trusting them uh, than uh, people having mistrust um, uh, on the other hand. So uh, for instance, at the very end of April, President Zelensky as the president and as a personal uh, and, and as a political person, these are like two kinds of uh, different ratings, personal trust and trust to the president as to the public institution. The trust from the public was uh, more or less the same, about 60% uh, of people um, demonstrated that they trusted him. At the same time, what is the phenomenon? That the president, uh, according to Ukrainian political uh, system, is not the person responsible for finding such challenges as COVID-19. Though Zelensky tried to become uh, the center of decision-making, so he even created a couple of consultation and coordination formats and platforms where he gathered specialists from other public institutions, but nevertheless, on the practical level, it was government and it was Ministry for the Healthcare who was responsible for finding all these challenges. Uh, but at the same time, uh, neither government, no parliament, nor um, uh, the Ministry for, for the Healthcare System uh, had the trust from the people. Instead, they, they actually had the, the high level of mistrust. For instance, um, the government, uh, um, to the government, there were about 30% of people tr who trusted them at the end of April, and it was almost 60% of uh, the average population with mistrust to the government. Uh, and here we, we come to the next phenomenon, which means that uh, the president in, in Ukraine in the time of um, the uh, uh, pandemia, he became, so to say, the mediator between the, the public, between all actually responsible for fighting COVID uh, institutions and society. And he was, you know, the informational link between authorities in general and practically uh, responsible institutions and people as the beneficiaries or as the consumers of all those uh, decisions made there. Um, it was a good decision, taking into account that he was uh, the only one trusted by people. But at the same time, it showed that there is the, the problem with institutional memory, with institutional strategic uh, policy making. It became obvious in the time of crisis. And one of the most important uh, arguments for that was that uh, there was the change of government uh, uh, just before the, the pandemic came to Ukraine. Uh, and in the time when it was already some limitations and some um, uh, challenges uh, fighted uh, within the Ukraine, we appeared to be without two ministers uh, who were very important for um, uh, 
for the uh, fighting uh, COVID and um, uh, overcoming all the economic problems. Um, and it included the Ministry for the Health Care, which uh, like resigned just after, or was actually made to resign just one month after his appointment in February. And then in March, there was the, the replace of, of the minister. So th there was the problem with institutional reaction to the COVID, there was the problem and disbalances between central and local authorities. But uh, due to the fact that on the local and regional level, um, the decentralization reform was started several years ago. And in my opinion, um, uh, it was actually the safety back for Ukraine in the time of COVID-19 because regional authorities and local authorities they they were the front runners in fighting on the practical level all the after effects of pandemic uh, and they have supported uh, the state so to say in the time when central institutions at some point of time didn't know what to do or made completely opposite things i mean different public institutions on the central level so these these are were uh, the so to say informational institutional or um, uh, connected with trust and public opinion phenomena of the pandemic and how the state was uh, uh, reacting to all those challenges another uh, important issue which also appeared in the time of pandemia and uh, uh, which describes uh, the issue of resilience of ukrainian state is the relation between the civil society and the state because uh, Ukraine is well known in, in Europe as a country with very strong civil society, very well organized, if we can speak about uh, some kind of self-organization of civil society. Uh, and just a couple of days ago, uh, we at Democratic Initiatives Foundation uh, published um, the latest uh, research conducted among NGOs all over Ukraine. Uh, NGOs uh, were asked and were polled about how they actually, how their work and activity have changed uh, in the time of uh, COVID-19 um, uh, pandemia. Uh, and it was interesting that uh, the, the, the instruments that NGOs uh, use to influence authorities in order to, to have the common results are almost the same as they were in the pre-pandemia time. For instance, the, the NGOs rely mainly on uh, using mass media, to, to widespread the information, to make informational pressure on authorities. Uh, and, they, and the second uh, mostly widespread instrument is to influence domestic authorities through international actors like international organizations or international partners. It means that um, there is some still some problem even in the time of crisis with direct uh, connections between civil society and authorities. And one of the problems which prevented uh, from fruitful direct cooperation was named by uh, NGOs as uh, like as um, some kind of prejudice coming from authorities to interact with NGOs. And it is also one of some kind of newer phenomena because um, after 2014, there was more or less organized new type of cooperation between civil society on the one hand and authorities, post-Maidan authorities on the other hand. Now, these relations doesn't, um, don't look the same as, they, as in the previous uh, five years, 2014-19, and they are rebuilt. Uh, and it seems that there is really some kind of mistrust or prejudice coming from new authorities, uh, mono majority in the parliament, but slowly I think it will change in, 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 and it will actually lead both actors to cooperation because for instance, civil society as, as our research showed, they rely in their majority on uh, cooperation and partnership, not on critics, not on being in opposition to authorities, but on being part of the process. Uh, and speaking about the challenges of uh, uh, coming for Ukrainian policy in, in the framework of uh, uh, Eastern partnership or in, in, in the bilateral relations between Ukraine and EU, I think uh, speaking strategically, one of the main challenges for the upcoming years and for the upcoming year, 
will be less of attention and less of focus on EP as a framework for cooperation with you coming less of focus from Ukrainian side, I mean. Because as of now, the main priority for the main foreign and at the same time domestic priority for Ukrainian authorities is to, to have some progress in uh, the conflict resolution with Russia. And uh, great attempts and uh, great uh, focus is made uh, and all the forces are actually um, oriented on having having some kind of uh, agreement, some kind of progress in minstrelatal contact group in the Normandy format. And at the same time, we, we see that the European vector is somehow like postponed for some future or is made on, you know, some kind of uh, pause in comparison to rather high dynamics, which uh, um, uh, you Ukraine relations followed after 2014, when we had visa free regime, when we signed the association agreement, when practical work started. So now we can say that there is some kind of slowing down uh, and this is not because uh, uh, only just because, for instance, domestic or internal problems with the European Union or lack of attention coming from the European Union, but also because current Ukrainian authorities are not as uh, focused on that uh, part of the foreign policy coming into the uh, also domestic, uh, domestic uh, dimension because uh, Donbass and relations with Russia became absolute uh, priority for 2020 and maybe for the future years as well. Thank you so much, Maria, for this great analysis and the conclusions. Um, we, as we are actually are out of time now, and I know that uh, you have other obligations, just a last quick question uh, to Andreas and to Yaroslav. As I know you are in a hurry to leave because we had numerous questions already from audience. I've seen uh, Pavel has been quite active in responding them. But there is one, and this is something which we haven't raised yet, that Eastern Partnership region and the Western Balkans are facing a lot of security challenges, not only from Russia, but also from China, also the numerous hybrid threats. So we're talking a lot about actually the Chinese influence in the Western Balkans, in Central Europe as well, in particular in Czechia. But uh, I haven't seen actually a lot of mentions, for example, in, in the Ukrainian media about the whole Chinese influence or Chinese threat or the, the systemic rival as uh, EU is calling uh, the state right now. So uh, there'll be a question on the audience, uh, from the audience. So how it can be reflected in the strategic documents of the EU institutions in future? What innovative approach do we need? And also what may be others your predictions also for that? Will China somehow step in into this region and maybe also in Russia, whether it, how, how it will behave in this post COVID world uh, take into account that the economy is affected and will be even more affected, but how it will affect basically yeah, the, the, the moods in Russia and uh, its foreign policy, especially towards the immediate neighbors. Well, well if I may answer just you know, a few sentences. Uh, China is of course a topic uh, which is becoming uh, more and more discussed in the European Parliament. And that is one of the changes which I saw during the last year, you know, uh, as a very rapidly developing. If before that, you know, usually what we were hearing that China is a big market and okay, there are problems with human rights and, and, and so on, but economy is more important. And, and that was a whole discussion. Now, uh, human rights, transparency, even all those stories with you know, uh, COVID-19 beginning, that becomes quite a hot topic. And I see a lot of different initiatives, you know, uh, with a major, con in, in, inside of European Parliament, which are major content on critical evaluation of, of uh, Chinese development. Uh, for example, Hong Kong, uh, defense of Hong Kong democracy is becoming uh, very, very, very hot topic, you know, and, uh, and that can change quite heavily, slowly, but it can change also EU attitude towards China. Uh, this year, here will be, you know, quite, quite important, uh, quite important uh, events like uh, EU-China summit and then EU-China trade negotiations. And I think that, at least in the European Parliament, it, be, it will become really quite a topic. 
you know, quite a topic because there will be a lot of demands and 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 uh, and objective demands on to to put pressure on you know defense of uh, human rights, democracy in Hong Kong, and so on and so on. So, how much China will be able to influence uh, you know global developments, including Eastern Partnership region? I'm not able to predict, but uh, I think that you know, as uh, COVID-19 can change quite a lot, uh, you know, in Russia, it can change also quite a lot uh, in China, and not always in, in totally negative way. It can it can open some new possibilities for you really to play that. Uh, again, I will repeat the same <laughs> the same word: geopolitical, you know, role uh, much more much more you know, effectively, in, especially in our region. And I need to say thanks a lot again and, and goodbye because I, I am running to Georgian TV now. <laughs> OK, so, bye. for being with us, and thank you. Yeah, Hope bye. Support to bye. the region. Bye-bye. Yeah. And yeah, so if you are still with us, if you're not running to the Georgian TV or Czech TV, uh, could you just please elaborate here yeah, maybe quickly on that as well? Um, more geopolitical question and the view from, from Prague. Hey, thank you, Alisa. I will be able to comment. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that the EU is not an imperial project. So we are not building the sphere of influence and we don't want uh, and we don't need to influence our partners foreign policy. This is their own choice. That's the uh, bottom line statement which needs to be done here. The second, uh, why the EU is attractive for partners, still I believe and hope that because this is because of the principles we are standing on. These are different principles uh, uh, from uh, the principles on which China, Chinese society and China uh, is based. This is a single party, this is a communist party, uh, uh, the country which is behaving uh, in a different way than the European Union and this uh, rule of law based and uh, uh, rule-based international order, sometimes uh, we have a big questions about uh, the Chinese commitment to, to these. Now, I understand that uh, uh, the Eastern Partnership countries are um, looking at China as a, some more distant pa power, which is not threatening because there is no border, there is no history of uh, any occupation or imperial behavior, etc. And China has cash, uh, is coming with uh, uh, the projects with the infrastructure uh, uh, possibilities and opportunities. So it's quite clear that China, China is uh, becoming a, an important player in that region. Now, still, I think that uh, these principles uh, are somehow um, um, are an important factor. And um, uh, also when we see some activities of China even in our countries, when the Chinese ambassadors are coming and uh, uh, sometimes even threatening, sometimes uh, um, saying stuff which are really not very usual to our culture, I think it should uh, start to um, uh, set on some red lights and, uh, and so on. So, I think uh, uh, China is a partner, it's an important country, we have to, it's, it's there, we will be dealing with it, uh, but still I think the uh, principles and the values are an important factor and I hope the Eastern partners will appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, you. I see Powell is uh, reacting positively to, to your words, so I would as we are really, really behind the schedule, I would just ask uh, every uh, our panelists to uh, maybe final statement, what you didn't have time to, to say in your uh, first intervention. Uh, what are the expectations maybe of, and or recommendations also from, from your national capitals on the, on the further uh, development of the system partnership initiative? And uh, how, how can the EU uh, help maybe the countries in this current or post-COVID, uh, Pata said you don't like to, to uh, change it now to the pre-COVID, post-COVID world, but we obviously understand that this uh, crisis will have a lot of consequences, consequences and uh, impact, which is still very early to, to look at. So, uh, Pavel, as we started with you, I will give you now the word to you as well. 
Thank you so much, Alisa. Just very, very briefly, because uh, uh, the view of our capital you have already uh, heard from from Yaroslav. So I would just, uh, you know, largely subscribe to what he to what he what he mentioned. Uh, just just maybe to underscore once one one more time, actually, because uh, we we in the EU are about to decide about a major major thing, which is the multi-annual financial framework, which is basically uh, the the funding for the next. Uh, seven seven years until 2027 and so basically what is not going to be in there is not gonna happen uh, on the ground so once again uh, i would like to appeal to to uh, you know mostly the eu decision makers and the member states in fact you know not to resign on this uh, strategic priority of czechia but also of the eu as i see it and and really dedicate enough uh, attention and financial resources to the development of, of this region because only this way we can really uh, strive for stability security and prosperity these are the original goals of the uh, european neighborhood policy and also uh, our goals for the eastern partnership thank you thank you so much uh, if somebody is ready i've seen pata you wanted yeah. to say something yeah? sure i would i, I would rather uh, um, um, would not make my concluding uh, remarks, but rather use this opportunity. And if I may ask a question to Jaroslav, um, is there any chance, uh, uh, and of course, uh, again, thank you very much for, for this great deal of opportunity. And uh, you know, time is never enough, you know, to, to, to continue uh, discussing very interesting topics of, 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 of what we were discussing. Yaroslav, is there any chance uh, to have the Eastern Partnership Summit uh, during the Germany presidency? Uh, we all know, of course, uh, uh, that uh, that's, that's, that's my knowledge that Germany sort of tried to be very blunt not to have, and that was before the pandemic uh, started, not to have the Eastern Partnership Summit uh, held during its presidency because it chose rather uh, other priorities uh, uh, that is, for instance, to have the China uh, EU summit as well as Africa uh, uh, EU summit. So, any chance to have a physical summit during the Germany's presidency? Thank you for the question. I think I would be a bad diplomat uh, uh, to tell you that there is no chance to have the physical summit during the German presidency. It is the first option of our national position. So there is a chance, but uh, we need to be vigilant and to push very strongly to make uh, a strong view of the member states. And uh, as there will be a very short discussion today, uh, as in any other business at the Foreign Affairs Council, let's hope that uh, by today, by the end of the day, or uh, really in coming days, we will know what will be the end game. Thank you. <laughs> Andre Maria, who would like to? Uh, well, as I said in the presentation, the um, uh, civil society and uh, um, independent media uh, were, uh, ha have been more proactive than the uh, state's uh, bodies in, in Belarus dealing uh, with the epidemic. So I, uh, uh, I believe that's uh, larger support to the NGOs, uh, which provides um, online services to the population is needed uh, and uh, greater support to independent media and uh, uh, influencers uh, which uh, raise important uh, social issues um, in uh, addition to um, overall uh, greater uh, digital transformation um, uh, supports and uh, uh, greater support to healthcare services of course. Thank you so much. Okay. And, ju and just to have uh, an optimistic uh, point at the end of um, this uh, fruitful uh, discussion, I would say that uh, uh, it would be really valuable for the Eastern Partnership, not only in the 2020, but for the upcoming years as well. Uh, if the plan for the European Union, how to renew the movement of people, the movement 
not uh, not only inside the EU but uh, um, from the third countries will make the specific point on the Eastern Partnership. It will be a very very good signal for the Eastern Partnership countries, especially those who have association agreement and used to make uh, in their informational domestic spaces emphasis and that they have some privileges, political closer relations with the European Union. If there will be some specific approach to this, at least three countries um, in the time when the European Union will incrementally open its borders, not to treat these countries on the same, uh, in the same way as some very far countries, which are uh, rather, uh, which have rather uh, much lower uh, links to the European Union. Uh, it will be a good signal because as of now, uh, it is not only about the movement to the European Union, but it's um, some fears appearing in Ukraine and maybe in some other countries as well in the framework of uh, Eastern partnership uh, issues, uh, some uh, fears that even the visa liberalization regime might be affected uh, by current situation. So it will be a really good political signal if the movement with our countries will be renewed much uh, in a much easier way than with very uh, than with some other uh, much weaker partners of the European Union. Yeah, please, sir. Sorry. So I will uh, I will keep it like my last word. So on that comment uh, of Maria, I would say, uh, in that situation, uh, politics should not play a big role, and sympathies to this or other countries are uh, not on the first under the first criterion this is epidemiological situation and this is really uh, the, the experts who are this who should decide about this and uh, i would strongly argue for this approach and not uh, uh, what country we like more or less and the beauty competition this is a serious this is a pandemic uh, this is about human lives uh, so that's very important to be said the last uh, uh, word I thank you very much for this invitation. It was a great pleasure to be here. Stay healthy, stay resilient, and goodbye. Thank you so much on this positive yeah. and recommendation. I, I join you in your message of staying healthy and resilient. Now we know much more about this uh, theory, not theory, but uh, the, about the storm. And uh, uh, let's follow the news today. Let's uh, hopefully we'll find out more about the upcoming news for the Eastern Partnership uh, Summit. Thank you again one more time for your great uh, inputs. I still have a whole list of questions to all of you and uh, I think we, we can continue and continue and maybe uh, next discussions in the next months after, after the summit so we will have uh, to discuss the results. Thank you again so much and yeah, stay healthy in your respective countries where you are now. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, Alisa. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you.